Hello, and uh, welcome to this EFSA webinar. I hear that we have 240 people registered for this webinar, which is a fantastic number, so we're really pleased about that. My name is Doreen, and I work for the EFSA Data Unit, or Evidence Management Unit, and I will be your main presenter for the first part of the webinar. Thank you, Doreen. Also, hello from my side. I'm Friedemann. I work for the Data Unit 2. And both of us are the presenters for the first half of this webinar today. We are supported by our colleagues behind the scenes who will help us to answer your questions. Please be reminded that this webinar is being recorded and will be published on the EFSA website. The layout of the webinar is as follows. In the right left top corner, you will see us and later the presentation. On the right hand side of the screen, you will find the Q&A box for the content questions and on the bottom left, you will find the technical chat where you can ask technical questions. Okay, so let's start. So just to let you know some background, the webinar will be divided into two parts. So the first part, we will give you a demonstration of how to complete the additive usage template. This presentation will take approximately 25 minutes and we will actually use some fictitious data to complete the template. While we're doing this, you can answer your questions, and uh, these will either be answered um, orally by us at the end of the presentation, or by our colleagues who are in the, supporting us in the adjoining room. Uh, a bit later, we will be joined by an, a, a different colleague, and he will present you the food additive intake model, and his presentation will last around 10 minutes. So, Doreen, let me ask you, what is the additive usage template? What is it used for and who can use it? Okay, Friedman. Well, the additive usage template was developed to allow uh, data providers to send their additive usage data to EFSA. So, this is data on the actual use levels of additives in food, defined by the food specification, for example, or by the recipe. The template and the guidance for completing it are published on the website with the EFSA calls for data. There's currently one open and I'll speak a bit about that later on. Uh, we encourage mainly people who uh, work for the food industry, food business operators, or maybe the industry associations who provide us with this data. And the information that you provide us is used in what's called the EFSA Re-Evaluation of Food Additives Programme. This is governed by Regulation 257-2010, but if you're not so interested in the regulation, there's more information available on the EFSA website and also on the European Commission website. So let's say I want to send my additive usage data to EFSA. What are my steps? What do I have to do? Okay, well, first of all, you need to go to the call for data, the, which is currently the batch seven call for data. And in that call, you will find a zip file. You need to download this zip file and contained in the zip file are two Excel sheets, one of which is the additive usage template, which we'll show you shortly. And the other is what's called the F standard sample description uh, additive, which additive template, which is formed is uh, connected to the additive usage template by a series of macros. Also within that zip file, there is a small guidance on how to activate this, the macros and also how to complete the template. So hopefully that will help you. We've actually done completed this step already because sometimes it takes a bit of time and we also wanted to have one line of data for you to see and then we'll complete the other line of data. So we, we sort of anticipated this step. So once you've completed your information, or you, you simply need to send the data to EFSA, we will check it. We might need to come back to you if there's any issues that uh, we, uh, maybe something's missing or something we need to clarify with you. But once the data is all complete and it's validated, then it can go into the EFSA database and it can be used in, in our scientific assessments. So, Doreen, here we've now opened the additive usage template and the layout has changed and I see there are different sheets. Mm -hmm. What do they mean and which one do I use? Okay, well, ordinarily the uh, template should open on the data reported sheet, uh, Freedom, and so this is the actual where you input your data. So, as you can see, there is, you can only see part of the template at the moment, but you can see it's actually basically an Excel file. 
Um, the other sheets really refer to uh, some Excel functions which cover the sort of operation of the template. So you really shouldn't concern yourselves with that too much. So let's have a take, let's take a look at the different layout and the columns which we have here. As you see, we have different colors of the columns. The first column is red and red columns mean they contain, they will contain mandatory information. This is information which we have to send to ESSA, otherwise the template will not be completed. Next, we have blue columns, which are optional. This is information which you can provide, but it's not necessary. So if you don't have it, don't worry. Further down to the right, we see that there is, there are different columns who have a hatched pattern, who are dark red, and those columns are dependent mandatory, meaning if you provide some information, it might be possible that they also become mandatory. And furthermore, there are orange columns, and those orange columns are recommended. This is information with, which EFSA wants, but if you don't have the information, you will still be able to submit your data to EFSA. And last but not least, we can find some gray columns. Those gray columns, we have two different types. This type of gray column here is being filled out automatically by the Excel tool. And please don't send any information in here. Otherwise, you will destroy the formula and the linkages will be destroyed. So the tool won't work anymore. And then at the very back, we can see again some gray columns. And those are performing some basic validation checks, seeing if you report all the data. So everything is fine. And just a useful tip, in case you don't know what to put in to the column, if you hover with the mouse over the column header, you will see there appears a small description um, describing what information has to be provided in this column. Good, excellent. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, today I'm going to play the role of a technical, um, scientific uh, quality person working for a company called ABC Foods. We manufacture a diverse range, range of foods and we use additives in our, in our food production for technological purposes. So, and I'm in, really interested in sending my data to EFSA. So uh, using this scenario, we're going to start off by saying that uh, we need to complete something that is unique for my data. So this is called the, what's called the sample ID. And uh, you have, uh, you're constrained by uh, 20 characters. So because I said we're ABC food, I'm going to use that as an indicator of this sample ID. Uh, we, we're going to actually going to report on, um, we're going to report on potato crisp freedom and we're going to say that the additive we're using in potato crisp, crisps is extract of rosemary. Oh, so you already know the number. So he's, what Friedman has done, he's put in the E number relating to rosemary extracts. And I'm asking him to ask you to put a sequential number. So we've already put 01 in, so let's put 02. And as you can see, you've, you've already created a unique reference, which is very important. And we'll come back to that a bit later on. So that is mandatory information. The next column is the country where the product is sold. And you have the, um, you have the choice to indicate up to six different countries. However, if it's more than six, then we should ask you to either put EAA in, which is the European Economic Area, uh, or um, the e European Union. So I think in this column, maybe we indicate a couple of countries, freedom, and so Ireland, Mexico, United Kingdom. Okay, good. Okay, and now we're entering the... Um, to how you report on actually on the food. So in this column C is a column called the EFSA product code. This is um, this behind this, and this is basically in the connecting um, Excel sheet that you will have downloaded is a is a catalog. It's a it's a list, if you like, of about 2000 food products. And what we want you to do in, to report in this uh, in this column is the actual EFSA product code. So if how you do this is as follows, and Freedom is going to show you slowly. So first of all, you have to have your cursor over the empty cell adjacent to the to the information you just put in, which Freedom is doing. You next move to the recode food. Good. And then if you could type potato crisps in that column, Freedom. 
Okay, and then you click on go, and you'll see that potato crisps um, is indicated below. What you need to do next is double click on that, and then another series of um, information will open in the uh, in the left hand column, and you find the correct description from the there it is, drop down list, list and you double click on that, and then you can close. As you can see, the moment we double click that, the column next to it was completed automatically. So this is one of the column which is filled out based on the information which you put in. Exactly. Very good. I think it might, just for um, clarity purposes, it might be worth perhaps doing another one. So let's do good. Let's say, I'll let you choose freedom of you seem very competent in this. <laughs> let's try to find some very high percentage um, cow milk. Oh. with a lot with a high fat amount so again what we do we put in milk or similar word to that then we choose um, the code from the right list and we go to the left find the code which we want to report so this time we want to report cow milk which is a higher fat percentage than four percent and again we double click it and as you could see the information was filled out automatically very good okay so um We'll come back to this food information a bit later because, as I said, there's 2,000 uh, different um, foods that you can report on. That doesn't cover everything that you, a company may produce or, a, or a, 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 an industry association has information on. So there's another, there's another place where you can provide some additional information. But that will come a bit later. Now we want to look at the additive uh, legislation. So in the in the regulation 133 2000 and, uh, 2008, there is the list of the authorised um, uses of food additives. So the, each food additive is authorised for use in, in, in a specific food category. And it's very important that you um, provide us with this information, as you can see, it is a red field, so therefore it's mandatory. So, for example, you can see and under number one, we've got the, the dairy products. I think under number two, it's fats and oils. And then three, edible ices. And under four, if you're scrolling down, yes, it's fruit and vegetables. So, oh, you're a lot quicker. So, okay, here we, we found what we, we, what we need to report on. It's the uh, processed potato crisp. So, you simply click on that and... It appear, appears in the field. Okay. So, Doreen, the next column, the food category, what does this relate to? Okay, this freedom, and that's a very good question because this is the this is a more lower level. That's what the LL, LL, LL represents. So, if there are, is an exemption or restriction that applies in the legislation, you can actually report a more detailed level for your food category use. Uh, usage levels. So, for example, for this, I think for this one, for we've got uh, processed potato products, so it's four, two, six. I think there's other categories, four, two, six, one, two. So, if one of the restrictions does apply, then you can provide this information. And if you, if it does apply, we really strongly encourage you to to put it in. Okay. Okay, still remaining with the food. A bit earlier I said that we are restricted by the um, recode food option to 2,000 items. So in this uh, column G, product full text description, this is a really, really crucial information for us. Because here, particularly if you don't find the food product you want to report on, you can describe the food in great detail. So you can put... The, the specific information relating to the food. You have uh, up to 250 characters, so you really, really can describe the food in a lot of detail. And for us in EFSA, this is really important information because we really, when we carry out our scientific assessments, it's very important for us to know what the food being reported on for additive use is. is. Okay, so a sorted potato crisp, but equally we could maybe put... Re we won't do it in this instance, but we could maybe put cheese and onion or something like that. But I mean, that's fine. But as I say, please put as much information as you have in this column. So moving on, the next four columns, as you can see, are blue. Uh, column H re relates to the consumption index. And this relates to whether the product is uh, widely consumed or is a... Um, is a niche product. Now, this is a decision you will have to make because... Um, 
because you know your market. So in this case, I think we can say that it's a widely consumed product. So if we select that option. Again, we're just using the drop down uh, arrow to, to find the options that are, are available. OK, now this next column is the food formulated for infants less than 12 months. Well, uh, in this case, if you have this information that the food is formulated, then please indicate yes. But I think we can be reasonably, reasonably confident that potato crisps aren't formulated for infants, so it would be a no. Uh, the final two columns relating to the food are both um, optional columns, and these relate to the brand name of the food or, and the manufacturer. It really isn't necessary to complete this if you don't want to. We would never share this information with a third party because it's obviously commercially sensitive. But if you want to report it, you have the option to do so. OK, so that's really relating to reporting on the food and the food legislative category. So we now move on to reporting actually things like the, quant the level of the additive use in the food, the additive itself, and some other additional information. So year of reporting, this would be usually the current year, so in this case 2018. However, if you manufactured a food several years ago, which was, is still available on the market because it has a long shelf life, you can indicate in this column the last year that you used the additive, so maybe 2016, but just to, just to say that, and maybe you can put a comment on that in the end, but we'll come to that in a little while. Remember again, here we have the gray columns. This is information where you, this is a place where you don't fill out information because it will be filled out automatically by the tool and Doreen will show you in a second. Okay, good. So let's skip these two columns and move to column P, which is the parameter text selection. In, again, we have a drop down list and in this list you will find the name of the food additive. Simply scroll down the list and we're looking for extracts of rosemary. So here we go, there it is, okay, and as you can see, when uh, Freedom and selected that option, the two adjacent columns uh, were filled in with the E number and also with, a, with a, a code which is called the parameter code. Now this is very important because the parameter code is actually relating to information we hold here in EFSA. And as you will see in result code, what has happened is this parameter code and the sample ID code has been combined to produce a longer code. Now, this probably won't be of very much interest to you, but for us, it's very important because if you are giving us lots of data, then and we have uh, we want to come back to you about a certain issue with your data, we will use this reference so it makes it easier for you to find the, the relevant record. OK, so moving on, um, we're now in column Q, and this is the parameter text. It may be, even though the call for data specifies that we want information on certain additives, you're reporting on a food product that also uses another, another additive which isn't in the call for data. So you can indicate information about that additional additive that's used in combination with, for example, the extracts of rosemary. So you can specify that additive in here. So as I say, this is, this is information. If you have it, you can put it in. But if you don't have it or it's not relevant, obviously, then don't include it. OK, so the next we're moving a bit on to the actual use level. So we report here the usage unit which for add additive uh, for in most well i think in virtually all cases is either milligram per kilogram or milligram per liter however as you see there there are a couple of other options and you can if this does apply to your use levels then you can report this we will convert it when we uh, when we validate your data but uh, it's very important to report kilogram milligram per kilogram, sorry, and milligram per litre if there is a maximum permitted level which is applies to the food additive use, which is specified in the legislation. OK, good. So now we are moving on to the next three columns, which are numerical columns. And in these three columns, only one of which is mandatory, which is the usage level typical, you indicate the minimum, the typical and the maximum level. Obviously, the numbers have to increase the usage level minimum will always be less than the usage level maximum, and the maximum will always be greater than the usage level typical. 
However, if you only have one value, then just report it in the usage level typical value. But I think for the purposes of this demonstration, we will indicate three different values. Good. Okay, so thank you, Freedom. And, and now we move on to the legislation. So, in the food um, additive legislation, some additives can be used um, to, at a level which uh, is uh, te the technical technological function of the food additive isn't restricted. So, you can use it as, as a level that is that fits in with your food specification. But for certain food additives, there is a maximum permitted level. And if this maximum permitted level is defined, then you need to select that option as Freedom and Eat is now showing us. OK, and then what happens is if you indicate that, then it becomes this dependent mandatory field. It becomes essential that you indicate in this column the maximum permitted level from the legislation. OK, so now moving to the function of the food additive. Here again, it's another simple drop down list. You can indicate what the function of the food additive from, from the relevant options. So uh, if you can, yeah, OK, that will flavor enhancer will use for this one. So um, that's very important information to complete. As you can see, the column is red headed. So, if you weren't, if you didn't provide us with that information, we would certainly come back to you and ask you for it. Okay, so we're nearly at the end of the reporting template. So we skip, if we just skip the next two columns, Freedom, and I'm going to explain why in a minute. So expression of result. This is uh, again essential information. So if we click on that cell, Freedom, and again use the drop down list. We have three options: whole weight, dry matter, or fat weight. Now, for the purposes we, of, the, of reporting food additive use, we can consider whole weight is synonymous with food as consumed or as placed on the market. So, uh, for this purpose, as it is a product that is placed on the market, potato crisp will, will select whole weight. However, if you were to select one of the other options, so the either dry matter or fat weight, then the two columns, column Z and column Y, become this become mandatory to complete. So for dry matter, column Y, you would need to indicate a percentage of moisture. And for fat matter, percentage of fat in column Z. OK, so now we're going to come to the consumption and dilution factor. This is very important information to include if, for example, your product is a, a powder and it needs to be diluted or um, reconstituted in some way, or it's a, core, it's a fruit drink which needs to have water added to it. Also, and uh, particularly relevant to rosemary extracts, if there is, a convert, there is a conversion factor that exists in the legislation. So if you are expressing the result for uh, carnosol or carnosic acid, you should indicate the conversion factor here. This also applies to some other, other food additives, such as phosphates too. But I, obviously, for the purpose of this demonstration, it's impossible really to go through all the different examples. OK, so we're near the end. Well, in fact, we are at the end. So com comment on the result. In this uh, field, you have uh, the option to um, include some additional information of, uh, of 20, 250 characters. So we really encourage you to do this. This is information that uh, maybe isn't captured elsewhere in the in the information you've provided on this food but it would really may help us really with our with our scientific work so you could provide some information about the the the, the uh, use level that is reported uh, whether the food additive is a is a car is a carrier so and information like this so if you have this we would really encourage you to to provide this but it is recommended because it's blue exactly so we have now finished all the columns where we have to provide information and as you see as at the very back here as explained earlier by me we find some basic checks so before you send then your information to EFSA and after finishing out the tool what you should do is you should go to the very back to the columns AD until AP and see if everything is green 
for example, the length of the sample ID. As Doreen mentioned earlier, it is recommended to not extend 30 characters, I think, and 20, I see 20, 20 characters. And as you see, it's okay, it's green, so everything is fine. So let's go to the very right and see if all the information is completed. And there's something which I can spot because it's red and it says missing reporting year. And what we now have to do, we have to go back to our data, see where we find the reporting year. The reporting year we find in column L. And as Doreen explained earlier, also this sample was taken in 2018. So I'll provide 2018 as a year here. And if we now go back to the validation columns, we should be able to see that the reporting year is now also green and all the other columns are also green. So this means you have provided all the necessary mandatory information and you will now be able to send the tool like this to EFSA. Perfect. Okay, so that's, uh, that's for, your, uh, for all the participants. I hope that's really helped and I hope that uh, it's very clear. Obviously, you can now ask us some questions. But if you are in uh, the next step, obviously, once you have provided this information, is to send your, your Excel file, this Excel file, the completed file with all your data in it to EFSA. Uh, we would always encourage you to refer to the EFSA website. As I said, there is a call for data, a call for data, the batch seven call for data published at the moment. And there you will find all the additives that, we'll, that we're seeking data on, as well as the zip file that contains all the, the relevant uh, support materials, the template, uh, the guidance, etc. So, so now there will be, we've finished um, completing all the information and now there will be some additional minutes where we will answer open questions from the chat orally and discuss them here on camera. And this will be before we change our setup and there will be a short demonstration of the FIME tool, the food additives intake model tool by our colleague Davide Acella from the exposure team. So I would say let's dive straight into the questions, shall we? Let's go for it, yeah. So as a first question, Doreen, is it necessary to always choose the lowest level of food category? That's a good question, yes. Only if one of the exemptions or restrictions in the legislation apply to your food. Yes, I think then it, it, it should be indicated in that in that lower level. Otherwise, it's it's enough to have it in the uh, in the um, other the adjacent cell, the the uh, food category class. That's that's absolutely acceptable. But again, it, it, we really encourage you to refer to the legislation and to check the lowest reporting level you can have for the food you you're reporting data on. Okay, thank you very much for this explanation, You're Doreen. Um, another question which I'm going to ask you here is, could you explain again the difference between column D and column F? Column D is the EFSA product code preview and column F is the food category. Okay, okay, so the EFSA, the, the EFSA, pro, the column D, or probably better if we look at column, yeah, column D, the, which is the name of the food. This is what's an EFSA catalogue of, uh, of foods. These, these, this list of 2,000 food items which you can choose from. Unfortunately, these don't completely marry. These don't completely correspond to the to the legislative food category food category class. And this really is why it's so important to provide some additional information in column G about the food because sometimes. It may be the case that you don't even find the under this column C, uh, under column D the right food to report on. It may not exist in the catalogue, but you may know that for the additive legislative uh, class that you can um, there is uh, an appropriate food category in which to report it. So in that case, this the information in column D becomes really really crucial, and I can't really emphasise that enough. Thank you very much, Doreen. I've actually uh, received some additional information to this question, so I'll um, elaborate a bit more. What description should be used in case when I report, for example, an additive which is used in a composed ingredient that we use in our final product? Shall the person who asked the question then describe the final product, for example, potato crisps, or end the level for it, or shall the person describe the ingredient? meaning the seasoning. 
and relate the level to the seasoning. Also for the maximum level, will this be related to the final product or the ingredient? It, uh, it will be related, the, the, the reporting level will be related to the, to, the final, to the final product itself, yes. So what you would do in this case is you would report, uh, if the seasoning isn't available in the food list, you would report the finished product and you would select the appropriate legislative class. I know this might sound a bit strange for the seasoning, if that exists, and I, off the top of my head, I can't remember at the moment. But then at the, at the, end, of the, at the end of the template, you could indicate that you're actually reporting the level, the, the use of the additive in the seasoning, which is an ingredient of the finished product. So I hope that's kind of clear i know it's it's a bit of a bit of a maze all this really because we have we have don't we have a strict alignment with uh, what exists in the legislation and and the food descriptions we're using in the template at the moment and the it doesn't obviously the food description doesn't have all the ingredients listed thank you very much for this further explanation doreen i have uh, two last open questions before sure. we wrap this our part up for a substance that could be used either as an additive or as a nutritional substance, should the data be reported only for the additive usage or also for the nutritional usage? Well, it's a tricky one, this. I mean, we really, this data is largely for, well, it is for the Food Additive Re-Evaluation Programme. So we're seeking information on the use levels of additives. However, it's not to say that we wouldn't be interesting if, in the additive it's, if it's used as a nutrient, because that's still very useful information for us to know. But strictly speaking, we are looking at food re-evaluating re the food additives that were authorised for use before 2009, and that's the main kind of objective. But that's not to dissuade you for reporting food additives also used as nutrients. Thank you very much also for this um, elaboration, Doreen. And then we have one last open question here okay. regarding information which you put into columns. We know we have uh, described a lot of the columns, but there's one particular question to again dive into the information which you put into column Q. Okay. So could you just explain that again, Doreen? Okay, so this, uh, this is information. So maybe let's start from the beginning. This. When we issue a call for data, we will specify which additives we're seeking information on because they are the next group of additives which are programmed for in the re-evaluation program. So when you report your food, we're seeking information on the list of additives that is indicated in the call. However, we do know that in different foods, more than one additive is used. And we, we would also want to know this information. So, for example, if the call for data was for extracts of rosemary, as it was included in the call for data, but you were using another food additive in these potato crisps, we would also like you to indicate this information here because this information is very important for our scientists to know. So hopefully that's clear. Thank you very much also for this question. So let me just check if we have some more open questions. No, that's not the case. So I'll give the floor again to you, Doreen. Okay. Well, thank you for your participation and thank you for your questions. I really, really hope this has been of a help to you. Uh, but it doesn't stop here. Um, we really want to have data and it's really, really important, as I I've described earlier, for our evaluation programme. There is a call for data which is published on the EFSA web, web, website with a deadline of the 1st of October. The additives are all artificial sweeteners and they're all indicated in the call. So we really, if you have any data on any of these, um, on any of these additives, we really strongly encourage you to send it to us because we would really, it's really useful for us as, as, I, as I've just said. Um, um, we, I think that's really all from us. We're now going to move to the next presentation, which is the fame. So there will be a, a couple of minutes break before you see the next presentation. Thank you for your attention and thank you for joining. And uh, sorry, last but not least, if you have any questions, there will be a slide at the end of the whole webinar giving you an email address. And if you have any further questions, difficulties, please don't hesitate to contact us. We're here to help you and we'll do whatever we can to assist you. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Good morning, everybody. Welcome back. My name is uh, David Arcella. I'm leading the exposure team within the, the data unit. And I'm here to present you the food additive intake model, the FAME template, the version 2.0. Uh, what is this? This is a web tool uh, that everybody can use to assess the exposure to chemicals and in particular to food additives. Uh, where you can find it, you, you can find it on the web, EFSA website. You can see under the application desk section, food ingredients, there is a section with the tools. The first one is, is the food enzyme intake model. But then if you go below, you find all the information related to the FAME template. There is a short explanation. There is a, a, a short video, a tutorial. You can, I, I would suggest you to have a look at this. And uh, far below, you can find a PDF document with uh, more detailed information and uh, the terms of use of this tool. Uh, in order to use the tool, you have to be registered. And to be registered, you have to send an email to this, web, to this uh, mail, data.collection at efsa.europa.eu. So to access the tool, you have to go here. So in order to do a, a live demonstration, I prepare a very short presentation to describe the tool a little bit more in detail. So here we are with the, with the presentation. So the FAME template 2.0. Why I'm stressing 2.0? Because with respect to the first version, we really introduced a lot of very innovative and powerful options. So again, what is the FAME template? Again, it's a screening tool for the assessment of chronic dietary exposure to new additives, but also already authorized food additives. Uh, we developed it thinking about applicants, risk assessor, and risk managers, but actually it's on the web. Everybody can use it, uh, scientists, whoever, even the normal citizens for their own uh, assessment. Uh, it is. As I was saying before, it is a web tool. Uh, it is a, based on a software called MicroStrategy. And the big step we have done with respect to the first version and is that this tool directly use raw individual food consumption data to assess the exposure. Data from different European countries directly from the EFSA data warehouse uh, and also for different population groups. So how it work? Uh, the user simply have to input the additive level. So let's imagine I'm uh, working from the company ABC, the one from Dori. I have four products for which I, have, I want to add a, a specific additive with these specific levels. The only decision I have to take is to which food categories these products belong. And the food categories are those listed in the food additive legislation. So because uh, the FAME template is based on the categories listed in the, uh, in the European Commission uh, directive for food additives. So in this case, the categories are 1.1, 1.7.4, and so on. So this is the only decision I have to take as a user, and these are the only information I have to input into the system. So what the system does. So uh, let's take an example of one single uh, subject. In this case, I call him Peter. So let's imagine we have Peter. We know his body weight, 18 kilos. And we know what, if, and how much he consume of the four categories in question on the first, on a, on a first day. So he consumed, for example, 200 uh, gram of milk and 80 gram of breakfast cereals, but he didn't have at all whey cheese. We know as well what he consumed on a second day. And so we can easily calculate Peter's average consumption of these four categories. The system basically uses this average consumption uh, to assess exposure. It simply match the consumption uh, levels with the additive levels and simply multiply to have the chronic exposure in milligram per day. The exposure from each single category is summed up to have the milligram per day. Then, since we know Peter's body weight, we can then assess the total 
chronic exposure in milligram per kilogram per kilogram body weight per day. And so we exactly know the exposure, the chronic exposure for Peter. Now let's imagine that we do this for all Peter's friends. In this case, we have uh, the exposure for uh, all of them. And so we can have a distribution of exposure. Out of this distribution, we can calculate the mean exposure and the 95th percentile exposure of this population. In addition, for this population, we can also assess the mean exposure contribution for each single food category. So let's imagine that what we have done for Peter, we can do for more than 666,000 subjects included in the EFSA uh, Comprehensive Food Consumption Database, where we have almost 7 million consumption events. So we can do this for all these population groups. So uh, for different age classes, different surveys, and different countries. So each of these is for us a population group, like Peter's friends. So the, this tool, the FAME tool, is particularly powerful because it allows to assess exposure for each of these population groups, for each survey, and for each country. In this way, we have the mean and the 95th percentile of exposure from the FAME template for each single uh, survey and country and population group. Here you have on the top the mean dietary exposure, again for infants, toddlers, other children, adults, and adults. And you can see, for example, for adults, you have each single country. Uh, it's small, but you can read. It's uh, Denmark, Austria, Czech Republic, and so on. And the same below is the same type of information, but in this case, it's the 95th percentile of dietary exposure, again, for the different population group and the different countries and surveys. In addition, the FAME templates also provide, again, for each single population group and each single country and each single survey, the exposure sources uh, for the different food groups. In this case, it's again the breakfast cereal, the witch cheese, and so on. Uh, for example, you can see, I don't know, here, uh, in Belgium, in Belgium, for other children, the main source is fruit juices, for example. So that's all uh, from my side. I hope uh, you uh, you clearly understood. I was I was able to clearly explain how the fame train, fame template works. Uh, it is available, as I was saying before, to everybody. You just need to be to register. Don't be too afraid if it, is, if it is a little bit slow. It's a massive amount of information that are analyzed on the spot for you. We are working to make it faster, uh, but uh, we still think that the, there is a reasonable time you have to wait to get the results. So I don't have anything else to add, only remind you that this webinar has been recorded. So you can watch it again later on, or you can send the link to your colleagues you prefer. Uh, so nothing to add. Thank you again for your attention and uh, looking forward to receive your data.